Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Sarah Rosen Wartell, and I have the great honor and privilege of being the president of the Urban Institute, and also to thank you for joining us on the sixth in our series of discussion with leading change makers and urban analysts on questions emerging from the COVID-19 crisis. First, just a few housekeeping notes. As uh, always, these events are being recorded and the recording and relevant leaks uh, to things that we discussed today will be posted online after the event for your reference. All of the participants are muted, um, but if you have questions or comments, you can type them into the question box at any time and we'll answer them at the end if we have time, but even if we don't, it's really helpful for us to hear what people are thinking about and we can uh, tackle those in other settings. We'd love it if you want to join the conversation on social media using Twitter, please use the hashtag live at urban. So um, at urban, we are inspired in every moment and especially in this moment to bring the power of evidence based knowledge to help change makers make decisions to protect families, communities and our economy. And we've all seen that this crisis lays bare the inequities that are baked into the systems and structures in our society. So we're thinking about our ways in which we contribute in this crisis in three dimensions. The first is we wanna to try to ensure that the response to the crisis is as equitable as possible and reaches everyone. Secondly, as people plan for a recovery, we wanna make sure it's a recovery that allows everyone to participate. And finally, we hope we will use this opportunity, uh, sorry and tragic as it is, to think about reform and reimagining of our safety net and societal systems, making structural changes to create greater equity and resilience from the kinds of increased shocks and stresses, whether it's from climate change, health pandemics, um, or economic transformation that we are seeing more and more. And at Urban, we have a fierce determination that this crisis will not be allowed to bake further the inequities into our society, but instead be an opportunity for making progress too long delayed. Now the long lines at food banks, and we're gonna hear a little bit about one in Tyler, Texas in a few minutes, are perhaps the starkest reminders to those of us watching, here we are in our homes, um, of the ways that COVID-19 has immediately disrupted, challenged, and devastated so many families, leaving not only working age adults, but also children and their families in crisis. Of course, this makes visible an everyday crisis that so many families were facing before the pandemic began. Now, not only are unemployment numbers climbing, wages dropping, food prices rising, but also the schools that typically provide for food for children, many meals a day are shut down. So it's not surprising that there's a simply enormous spike in the number of families that are food insecure. To discuss the food insecurity crisis today and how we tackle it boldly, I could not be more pleased than to be joined by Claire Babineau Fontenot and Elaine Waxman. Claire is the CEO of Feeding America, which is the nation's largest domestic hunger organization and the second largest charity in the US. And she's joining us today from Tyler, Texas, where I hope she tells us about uh, just having been part of the delivery of food to many families in that community. Feeding America's network provides more than 4 billion meals to more than 40 million people across the US and supports programs that improve food security for families. Elaine Waxman was formerly the research director at Feeding America, and we have been for the last years now lucky to have her as a senior fellow at Urban. Her expertise includes food insecurity, nutrition, and the food assistance safety net. And if you are not already a subscriber to the Urban Institute's Critical Value podcast, um, I encourage you to subscribe now, and you can listen to the most recent episode where Elaine talks at uh, further length about what the evidence tells us about food insecurity. Now with Claire and Elaine today, we're gonna to talk about a couple things. First, uh, what both data analytics from Urban and Feeding America are telling us about the scale of the food security crisis and who's most affected and the importance of disaggregating the data and gathering the best information possible at time of decision to help people in the response and recovery. We're also gonna talk about some of the policies and tools that practitioners and lots of other actors in the system have at their hand to try to increase food security right now. 
And finally, I think we're going to talk a little bit about how change makers who are looking for a extended recovery period can try to make sure that we use this moment of change to bring everyone along and end up with a system that's more equitable and inclusive. So Lane, I think we're going to start with you. Um, and are, is, is your uh, screen up? Um, if so, we'd love to know if you could um, about um, who is most at risk of food insecurity right now. Why in particular did COVID expand the number of people insecure? And um, to what extent are we seeing different communities in our country reflecting their own unfortunate, our own society's own unfortunate history um, of, uh, of racism and segregation and um, lack of concern. How much? How is that reflecting it in our uh, experience of food insecurity in the crisis? Elaine? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you. Those are all good questions. So briefly, when we talk about food insecurity, we think about what it means to have uncertain or um, unstable access to a nutritionally adequate diet. And we know that this pandemic has been layered on um, a pre-existing uh, situation where we still had 37 million Americans coming into this who were struggling with food insecurity. We also know that um, food insecurity had not returned to pre-recession levels until 2018. So we spent a decade sort of digging out from that spike before which is what gives us real pause about what may happen here even after the public health emergency subsides. We're still learning a little bit about who is being affected right now. Um, in general, we know that unemployment is a big driver. And so for every point that unemployment tends to go up, we usually see um, food insecurity rates go up about a half a percent. Um, we were a, uh, able to do a survey at the very end of March, early April at Urban, and found that about one in five uh, households across the country were reporting food insecurity, um, but also uh, closer to one in four for families uh, with children. And to your point about you know, who's most vulnerable, we see those very stark um, disparities by race and ethnicity um, that we've always known exist um, with respect to food access, but are extremely pronounced right now. So almost, 40% um, of Latino um, or African American households, and uh, even more perhaps if you have an individual in your house who is not a citizen and may not be able to access all of the services. So Claire, I gather you were part of a food distribution effort there in Tyler. Um, talk to us a little bit about what you were seeing there and more generally what you're seeing across the whole network um, uh, of Feeding America about the scope of the pandemic's effect? Well, let me begin by saluting Urban, not just for asking us to participate, but by your body of work in this space. Uh, never have we needed you more than now. So thank you for everything that you do. Um, so where am I right now? I'm in Tyler, Texas, and I just had an opportunity to participate in a food distribution, which is becoming a familiar site for people in this country now, where there were miles and miles of cars that were uh, piled up as people waited in line um, in the hopes of getting food to feed themselves and their families. And one of the most striking things I think for me was when a reporter who was there asked me uh, whether I was surprised because we're looking out and we couldn't see the end of the line and we're standing in a parking lot at a big convention site here in Tyler and you couldn't see the line and the cars were moving. You could still not see the line from all the way wrapped around that facility. And he asked if I was surprised and unfortunately my answer was no, I, I was not surprised. Um, we have seen throughout our network, which represents the whole country and territories, um, an overall increase of about 60% year over year over the course of the last couple of months since the pandemic started. We hope it peaked at 70%, we hope, uh, but there are some, some um, headwinds coming that might cause that number to rise yet again. To Elaine's point, just as the country has seen uh, a lack of 
um, progress around uh, rehabilitation, if you will, recovery probably is the best term, recovery from the last recession it took 10 years. Well, that was, was born out inside of our network as well, where, where we were feeding over 50 million people and we, it started moving down and right before this pandemic hit, we were feeding about 40 million people. Um, there's no question uh, that we will have fed far more than that before this crisis is over. Uh, we will hope for the best, but we will have to plan for, for what the data has said in the past and, and what we're anticipating is, is to come. So I might just quickly, Sarah, tell you that we have um, done some analysis. Uh, Elaine is very familiar with the, the work that's done at Feeding America around research. We were privileged to have her as a member of that elite team in the past. Um, but the data that, that we're privy to suggests that over the course of a six month period, that the gap just inside of our network system for people that we serve, we estimate it to be at about $1.4 billion. billion. Um, we'll talk, I'm sure, later on about some of the things that have been done that can help and that hopefully we'll be helping with that. But just since, um, just in about two months, so from the beginning of the pandemic, uh, really hitting around March timeframe, um, late March, early April to um, just after May, we've already provided a billion meals. And Sarah, you mentioned that last year we provided 4 billion meals, uh, a little over 4 billion meals. That was in 12 months. Uh, our estimates would suggest that in the 12 months ahead, there will be an 8 billion meal need. So definitely, definitely uh, challenging times for people facing hunger. And I just want to ask you very quickly, um, we didn't plan this, but one of the things that I'm hearing is that as the crisis is unfolding, in some ways it's becoming too easy to other those who are uh, most in need to sort of imagine that someone else. So since you were literally um, helping to put food, <laughs> to do intake and put food into cars of individuals. Um, I just would wonder if you would reflect on um, the diversity of American life experience that you were seeing coming through that um, car line. Yes, uh, I, I have, I'm privy to lots of data on the overall statistics and I saw it borne out today before my own eyes. Um, I saw various ethnicities, I saw various age groups, I saw parents with children in the car, I saw seniors, um, so absolutely, so I saw the array of people. Uh, one of the things that I mentioned even today as well uh, to a reporter is that, that if they looked at the line, they'd see that some of the cars out there look like pretty nice looking cars, and some people have extrapolated from that, well, those people must not need help. No, to the contrary, um, one of the things that this shows is that it could happen to anyone. You could be going along perfectly able, feeling perfectly able uh, to provide for your family, to afford the car that you drive and to feed uh, your children. And then something happens suddenly and you find yourself without the wherewithal to provide for yourself. So that was all played out in that line as well. So you're, you're absolutely right. And, and our, uh, Elaine might have mentioned this, but we've definitely seen uh, so far uh, that at least 40% of the people who are turning to us for help have never before had to rely upon the charitable food system. So this is um, anyone, it's, it's your neighbor, it, it's you, uh, it's us, it's we, it's not other. So Elaine, um, Congress did, uh, has now tackled um, this problem and provided a significant amount infusion of resources. Can you describe um, a little bit more about um, what the legislative response has been so far and what some of the current uh, policy proposals that are at least at the federal level on the table at the moment? Sure. There have been some really important early responses. Um, one of those was to uh, suspend work requirements for SNAP, which is really critical, obviously, right now with widespread unemployment, um, and to allow states to increase their SNAP benefits through an emergency allotment up until the maximum level that a house could, could um, qualify for. 
So those are important um, immediate responses, but those only last to, uh, for the extent of the public health emergency. And we're not sure when that will be declared over, but it will certainly be declared over long before the economic fallout um, continues to play out. So one of the things that's really being um, attended to right now in the potential next round of legislation is actually increasing the overall benefit level, the maximum benefit level for SNAP um, by 15% um, and allowing that to be in place for a much uh, more significant period of time. This is an evidence-based solution. This is exactly what was done during the Great Recession. Um, and we know from research that that helped really buffer food insecurity during that period of time. So we have a good evidence-based solution and that is a, a key part. The other um, thing we're, that I think a lot of folks are looking to is to, to continue to suspend the implementation of any rules that would otherwise narrow access to SNAP because obviously SNAP is going to be extremely critical right now. We also have to remember that not only does it help people put uh, food on the table, it's a great community stimulus. And so for every dollar uh, spent on SNAP, it comes back to the community in terms of the wages for people working in grocery stores and to producers, um, anywhere from $1.50 to $1.80, depending on the study. So Claire, um, Congress uh, did as um, Elaine described with um, expanding access and um, expanding the dollars available for food stamp stamp benefits. Um, they also did uh, made an investment in building the capacity of uh, food bank systems and in trying to help deal with the disconnect between distributors. Can you describe that, but then also talk about what you think uh, we maybe needs to be done? Uh, Elaine raised some of the challenges with the uh, duration of the assistance. What is, what's on your priority agenda? Oops, Claire, did we lose you for a second? a bipartisan way where there was funding that I, um, hello do you hear me now you're back thank you very much awesome. okay sorry about that um, so we we did uh, we were grateful to see that there were some uh, some that some of the needs of our network were in fact addressed in a bipartisan way in some of the early legislation that, that funding was for food and for the, um, the apparatus necessary to get the food in place. And we're grateful for that. When we say that the gap is 1.4 billion, the good news is that a piece of that funding can go against that 1.4 billion six month window the problem is that it doesn't fully close that window. So I, I'm so pleased that you asked the question about um, what it is that we think might be good solutions going forward and what we need to do. And Elaine and I, I, I know share a view about the importance of SNAP um, for all the reasons that she just assigned. So the audience may well already be aware, but some of the types of restrictions that there, there sometimes are and there's regulations designed um, in, in normal times that say things like you need, there's a work requirement. So you've got to go out and try to find a job. Um, when you have a contracting environment where there's so few jobs available, when you're being told by health professionals that, that it is in the pub public interest for you to stay at home, then that type of requirement is really not going to be one that we ought to be putting on top of this pandemic. So. So I have a, um, an aspiration, as do the members of, of our team at Feeding America and so many else, uh, that we strongly prioritize SNAP. Um, I have no aspiration to see this line continue to be as long as it is. We, we have a strong desire that that line shrink, uh, that, that people facing hunger in this country, that they have an opportunity to go into a supermarket and buy the food that they need uh, or purchase the food that they need for themselves and for their family, families. And that's what SNAP can help to do and in a way that's so stimulative. So it's, it's such a, a great way of solving for multiple problems all at the same time. So absolutely agree with Elaine and has, her assessment. So Claire, I wanna come back to you. Um, 
if we think about the delivery system that you just described, there is essentially getting purchasing power in the hands of consumers. And ultimately that will reach many more people than even quadrupling or tenfold increases in your network. But it is, there are lots of people for whom those safety net programs miss or are insufficient. Um, there's expansion of the capacity of your system. There's also some interesting innovation starting to happen. Um, uh, most famously, we're all seeing uh, excitement around the efforts of Jose Andres, who's been talking about, you know, our shuttered restaurants as potentially part of a delivery system. Um, and um, some really interesting efforts I know that you're part of, of trying to deal with the mismatch between distributors whose demand from restaurants and, and hotels and other things and schools collapsed and the food bank networks that you have. So could you just talk a little bit about how you were thinking about innovation in this moment? And is, is one of these a promising network or should we a uh, delivery system or should we be doing all of the above? Yeah, so quickly the answer would be, we should be doing all of the above. So um, softball. <laughs> so the things, yes. So one of the things that we've got to do is to be to take the old playbook and just throw it away. It no longer applies. And oh, by the way, it wasn't a great playbook to start with. So let's build a new one, right? Let's create a new one. And I think there's so much opportunity for innovation that creates win-win scenarios for so many segments all at the same time. So we can do well and do good at the same time. So uh, so things like what Jose Andres has, has recommended that seeks not only to provide food for people facing hunger, which certainly is of paramount concern for my network, but also finds uh, an elegant way to keep restaurant, people who work in the restaurant in industry in business and doing the thing that they're so good at to begin with. So they know how to prepare food and they know how to deliver really tasty food to people who need it and who want it. And I think it's a lovely, uh, a lovely thing for us to be thinking about. But I really think that one of the one of the traps of scenarios like this would be for us to to believe that there's one silver bullet. There simply isn't. So there's a need for fundamental changes in policy. Uh, there's a need for an acknowledgement of the fact that even even at the highest level, I believe that the maximum amount that anyone gets on SNAP is about a dollar and eighty six cents um, per meal. Uh, I spend a lot more than a dollar and eighty six cents per meal, and that's at the maximum. But there are people who receive eighteen dollars um, in total SNAP benefits. I think we need to be really thoughtful about policy. I think we need to make it easier for people to be helpful in these situations, help businesses to uh, um, do things that will stimulate innovation in, in industry in terms of partnerships. You know, think about tax policies that are stimulative to, to charitable giving uh, and, and to these partnerships. And then you talked about one of the mismatches and I heard Secretary Purdue say this and I think some people thought, well, is that right? And he was exactly right uh, about a statement that he made when he mentioned uh, that when it came to, to food in this country, that we actually have enough food in this country to feed people who need it, uh, that the issue was a connection issue. And he's absolutely right about that. So we shouldn't be throwing away milk when people um, don't have enough to eat or to drink. And there are ways to come together in, in co-creation around that. So I, I feel we've got some promising signs around some of the initiatives that have already happened. My bet, my biggest concern, Sarah, as you and I have talked about before, is that these lines um, of cars, they're just gonna go inside of buildings. And they'll be less visible. And we'll all less forget. Visible, and we will forget because there's, there's no reason to believe, and in fact, there's every reason, there's no reason to believe that it will not be a marathon. So and we so, have a ton of questions. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Yeah, so I was oh, just oh, gonna oh, say, yeah. this is likely to take a while. This recovery is likely to take a while. So when the health side of this pandemic has abated, and I, I'm, I'm hopeful that it's gonna happen really soon, it's highly probable, that tens of millions of new people are gonna need our help and that about 20 million of them are gonna be kids. Yeah. So Elaine, um, you introduced me to a term 
that um, I really like and am using all the time now, Build Back Better. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I just wanted you to uh, touch it at a high level, because I think this is a pretty sophisticated audience with a lot of great questions, sort of what are some of the things that we ought to be doing now to build back better, and if our goals in building back better is also to make sure that it, we build back more equitably, um, what would you prioritize um, that we learn from this crisis and how do we do that? Yeah, I think um, build back better is something that the international community has thought about for a long time. And that's one of many lessons we should be learning from our um, other neighbors. A few things, as Claire mentioned, SNAP benefits are inadequate. We know from before um, COVID that the maximum benefit did not cover the cost of a low income meal in 99% of US counties. That needs to be fixed on an ongoing basis, particularly since we're seeing the largest increase in food prices we've had in this country since the 70s. Secondly, summer, summer, summer is a very vulnerable time always because kids are usually out of school. Obviously they were out earlier and we've had some really heroic responses from school systems, but we're gonna need every possible tool we can to get through summer. And as Claire knows all too well, this is also potentially hurricane season and wildfire season. And there are so many other things that may be um, calling for our attention as well. So we cannot take our eye off of how deep and how um, persistent this is gonna be. And then I think the third thing is we need to, as we we're having this conversation about racial and ethnic disparities, stop investing in every community in exactly the same way. We've known for years where some of the most vulnerable communities are, including, for example, Native American communities that are being hit very hard by COVID right now. Um, we need to go deep and much more sustainable in many of those communities. Some people who are experiencing food insecurity now will eventually get back. It will take them a while, but this is being layered on injustice and uh, systemic racism that we've had for years and we've just not grappled with. And that like to me is the biggest challenge for building that better. So that's a great uh, segue, Claire. Um, I was gonna ask you just to talk first about communities um, and we could go through a litany of uh, the difficulty on reservations, the difficulty in rural communities, the difficulty in inner cities. I mean, there's, there are different patterns exactly as Elaine suggests, um, um, but there's severe need in each of the different areas. So instead, I'm gonna ask you to lift up solutions. Um, where do you see, um, one of the questions was, um, I'm not sure you're gonna wanna uh, uh, name and shame the, the best in the, um, the leaders and the laggards, but are there states that you would lift up at least as leaders in making progress? and models that we ought to be pursuing? Um, and are there different strategies for different communities? And then I'm gonna turn to both of you to do a final sort of a lightning round about different sectors. Well, so yes and, and yes. So there are, there are some places that are really taking, a, even before COVID, that have really wrapped their arms around and tried to come up with some systemic changes that I think could be helpful I think Oregon stands out as one of those places that has gotten so serious about access to food for children um, and has done some things from a policy perspective that I think could be lauded and, and should be replicated in other places. Um, I don't, I have yet to, to, to go to a place that I think has it exactly right. Um, I think there, there are pieces to learn from various uh, places and I'll bring it all together. I think. Step one is to raise our level of awareness. There, so much of this was hidden in plain sight, Sarah. Uh, and when I learned, for instance, about what the underlying conditions were that would make this virus uh, more challenging for a person, I knew immediately that people facing hunger were gonna be inordinately impacted. I knew it because people facing hunger are in, inordinately suffer from every single underlying condition that had been outlined. I also knew that communities of color we're gonna be inordinately impacted because communities of color inordinately suffer from each of those underlying conditions. I think it's time for us to say those things out loud. Start by saying, by being honest about what the data says. Some of this, as I've talked to my team about, some of it is math. Some of it is unassailable, it's math. 
So let's start with an honest assessment of where things are. And then let's do as Elaine just described. Let's not pretend that every community needs the same thing. Every community doesn't need the same thing, just as every person doesn't need the same thing. Let's meet people where they are. Let's make inordinate investments in communities that have the greatest need. I know that's something that we're very seriously focused on at Being America. We want to be a part of the solution in this space, and we hope that we'll find partners who want to do that too. And we want to dig deeply and, and address some of these systemic concerns uh, that are out there. So I think that's another point. But I think it'll take innovation across the board, public, private, nonprofit partnerships, nonprofits themselves. We must come together in solidarity around the same mission and find ways that we can work more collaboratively uh, as, as a sector. So um, I wish there were one silver bullet answer to any of these questions. If there were, I guess you wouldn't have me on, you wouldn't have Elaine on, and you would be at the Urban Institute for that matter. Um, but I do think there are some really meaningful ways that we can make progress. Um, and I think a lot of the people who are listening in and watching know what those things are. I think it's time for us to do them, get out of our own way and go do them. So Elaine, we do have um, people from the federal government, state and local government, people who run food banks and other community foundations and nonprofits who are delivering services, um, people from the private sector and philanthropy and probably from the food distribution system. So I'm gonna ask each of you in kind of a lightning round starting with government, and then we're going to come back to the delivery system, and then we're going to come back to the nonprofit and philanthropic sectors. Um, top priorities for people right now, what should their organizations be doing? So uh, first Elaine, then Claire, super short. Uh, government, first Fed and state and local. Elaine? So we've talked about SNAP. That's the first line of defense. Um, Bull Street SNAP is the biggest thing we can continue to do. But in addition, we've um, fed a lot of people through waivers of requirements for school meals and we need to double down on every conceivable angle from that including the new option pandemic EBT which is a replacement for school meals. It won't meet everybody's needs but it's another tool in the toolbox. Um, states are being asked to do so much right now and we know the caseload is rising so state uh, administrators are going to need more resources at their disposal if they're going to be able to meet the needs. So we have to pay attention to that. Policy, federal, state, and local, Claire? So I think my top ones would be the ones that Elaine just said. I would just add then. I get a chance to add something <laughs> um, uh, to say that I do think that we can incentivize industry to partner even more effectively with, with, um, with the charitable food system and in, and more effectively for people facing hunger. And I think we ought to think about it in that way as well. When we're thinking through uh, policies like tax policies, we ought to be thinking about it through the lens of and how might that incentivize people to get to the table and to be even more helpful than they've been in the past. Um, next, the private sector in all their different capacities, um, both as employers uh, of people who may have food insecurity, but also um, part of the, the distribution system that um, uh, produces food and sometimes doesn't, to the Secretary Purdue's point, always get it to the places where the need is greatest. Um, this time I'll start with you, Claire, and then go to Elaine. That's a space where I think we're really building some traction and I'd say let's keep on doing what we're doing right now. Let's not allow um, business as usual to cause us to go back to where we were before. I'd say um, there's a vibrant role for the private sector to play coming to the table with the nonprofit sector as well as with, with the public sector and thinking through uh, effective strategies. Uh, we have had some of the best minds in industry come to the table with us to think about how are we going to look at the last mile, for instance? How are we going to make certain that people who live in remote regions actually have access to food? There are highly effective private solutions that we need to be overlaying on top of the challenges that we're seeing um, in the nonprofit space. And, and I'd say, I know that some of those conversations are happening. I think we need to continue with them. And I think we need to start testing them. And then we need to scale them out. Elaine, private sector? 
Sure, private sector can help bring strategies uh, on a wider basis to both uh, clients of federal programs and also clients of charitable feeding. Things like online ordering and home delivery and uh, creative ways to not have people standing in line. So that's one thing. But the other thing is um, the food sector as an employer, as a distribution system is the bedrock of this country, right? It's, it touches every single one of us. And so the health and well being of those workers is part and parcel of how we feed ourselves. And we've uh, revealed some real gaps and challenges there, and we have got to fix them because the sad truth is that food insecurity has always been elevated in the very industry that feeds this country. Um, and I just, one other uh, goal I um, mentioned about the private sector is that we were talking before that those, that local strategies for delivery, many employers are anchor institutions in those local communities and they can partner with our last sector. Talk a little bit about the role of the nonprofit uh, sector, both the food bank system and the other nonprofits that are trying to deliver a whole range of systems and philanthropy, particularly philanthropy that may be focused in different parts of the country in meeting particular needs. What would you have them do next and what would you have them do over the longer recovery period? Claire and then Elaine. Right, so um, we have, I believe, 1.3 million um, nonprofit organizations in, in the registered nonprofits in the United States. Every single one of them, I'm sure, um, was founded on some remarkably important um, mission. I, I have said, and, and now I have enough space to make it clear what I mean when I say it, I said I don't believe that we lack the number of resources focused on issues facing humanity. I think we, where we lack is all of us focused on it together and being synergistic. So I, I said more than once, and I will say it again, we, we at Feeding America are, are going to work hard to be great collaborative partners with other nonprofit organizations. We have a history of working with other nonprofits. I believe we need to convene ourselves and think about all of those wraparound services that are gonna be necessary in order to help people to emerge. Because food insecurity is not, doesn't exist in a vacuum. It's it's one of the symptoms of poverty, for instance. So when you solve for food, you need to solve for food along with solving for other things that impact people in terms of housing in order for that, uh, that elevation out of food insecurity to be sustainable. So my number one ask of, of other nonprofits and of ourselves is that we find ways to sit at tables that we convene together and partner um, on in, in this work because they're brilliant, capable, hardworking, dedicated people working on things. We're just working on them all at the same time in different rooms. Let's get into some of the same rooms. On the philanthropy side, I would ask that people be willing to make deep long-term commitments. Um, this is, is not, these things are not easy to do. And what is sometimes difficult in philanthropies is to get multi-year commitments but it's usually a multi-year challenge. So, so we have fits and starts with some of the initiatives that are undertaken by nonprofits, and then you lose funding. So you have, you pilot something and now you have reason to believe you've built a case for something that really can be helpful, and now you no longer have the funding to take it the last mile. So I ask that people find partners that they trust, that they believe in, um, and causes that they believe in, and then have deep, long-term partnerships with those partners. Sorry about that. So Elaine, uh, take us home. Uh, your final plea to this sector. <laughs> so I think first I want to acknowledge what an amazing job the nonprofit sector has done in, in basically handling an emergency in all 50 states and all the territories at the same time. And, um, but I think uh, to Claire's point, they're all in disaster response now. So they need a lot of resources in the short term and that's where philanthropy can step up. But the Build Back Better also requires that long-term multi-year commitment that, that Claire has talked about. Um, and that's, I think, a lesson for philanthropy because again, all of the things that have been happening have exposed for us how central 
and how vulnerable in many ways our food system is. And this is an opportunity to grapple with that, realizing that it's not just about feeding people in need, it's literally about the underpinning of public health in this country. We've long time treated food insecurity as if it was a social welfare problem. It's a public health issue. And so I think this is a time to, to shift um, our whole philosophy in why and how we invest um, in this sector. Well, I'm struck listening to both of you that um, uh, as everyone is racing to the immediate moment and immediate crisis and, and doing so nobly, um, that those of us who have a little bit of um, capacity to be thinking about the systems and structures need to be mindful that this crisis, I hope, will never repeat itself, but others will. And the, we are seeing that we're at a time in society when the pace of change, technological change, climate change, demographic change, and potentially globalism bringing health and other cyber and other risks to us mean that we're going to be uh, vulnerable to risks in the future and resilience, building a system that works well for everyone. That is an, a really critical part of our task so that the next crisis doesn't lead to needing to provide 50 million uh, meals in uh, a matter of months. Um, we could not be a better position to try to tackle those challenges than to have our fabulous partners at Feeding America who are just doing a spectacular job through this crisis. Thank you, Claire, for taking time out from Tyler uh, to be with us. Um, really glad, uh, Elaine, that you're with us and helping us think about this. Uh, thanks to all of you for having joined us and join us again next week for the next one soon to be announced in this series um, and uh, to continue to track the work we're going to be doing around food insecurity and the safety net. Um, thank you, everyone. Be well. Take care of those uh, you love and be safe. Take care. Thanks for having me. Great pleasure. Thanks, Thank Lynn. you.